Have you ever um, had an assignment or a job that you did, but kind of half-heartedly? You know, you just weren't really fully invested in it. I remember when I was in college, one of the jobs I had for a season was I was the uh, student intern for the California State Library Office. And uh, this was the, the state agency that supported local libraries. Um, and I thought that seems like a pretty cushy gig for, for a college student. And, and, and it was, um, but to a shocking degree. Because when I got there, I was informed that, you know, they really wanted to make sure that they didn't lose their funding. And so they didn't want anybody to get the idea that they didn't have work for me to do. So I wasn't supposed to read or do homework while I was on the job. It's fine. Part-time job. They're paying me to be there. The problem was they didn't always have work for me to do. And so I was uh, told to take my time on whatever task I was given. I was encouraged to take lots of breaks. Um, I was frequently put on the front desk where the phone would ring two, three times an hour and not given anything else to do during that time. After a while, I was not exactly putting in my best effort in that environment. Um, and so you, you can understand that in a situation like that. But, but what can become a problem is in that same half-hearted effort, that same half-hearted mentality gets applied to other places in life. At other times in life, I've had jobs where that level of effort would not have cut it. And what is really concerning is when we take that half-hearted attitude, that reluctant service, and apply it in our relationship to God. And that's what we want to consider this morning, is what happens when we serve God only half-heartedly, only reluctantly? Is it okay? Is it good? Is it better not to serve Him at all? Does it mess God up? Does it mess me up? What happens when we serve God reluctantly? Or half-heartedly. We have a pretty good example of that, I think, in our passage this morning as we continue our series in the book of Jonah, part three of four this morning. In this series, we're calling The Wrong Way Prophet. Uh, we have seen so far that Jonah was a prophet of Israel, and up until our story begins in the book of Jonah, he had a pretty good job as a prophet. Uh, the only other recorded mission he has in scripture is that he got to tell the king of israel that even though israel wasn't really serving god very well even though the king of israel at that time was actually a wicked rebellious king who was serving false idols the lord yahweh the god of israel was still going to bless and protect israel and give them victory over their enemies so that they could reclaim the land pretty good job if you could get it as a prophet but at the beginning of our story, he gets an assignment he doesn't like. God tells him to go to the great city of Nineveh to preach against the sin and wickedness in that city. And Jonah says, no way. He goes the opposite direction. He goes down and he gets on a boat trying to go to the far corner of the known world, a place called Tarshish. But God doesn't let him get away. He sends a storm and the ship is going to sink. And despite Jonah's attempts to escape the whole thing by taking a nap in the bottom of the boat while the ship is sinking, the sailors wake him up, tell him to pray to his God. They find out that he's actually the reason that the storm has come. And they ask him what he should do. And Jonah knows exactly what he needs to do. He needs to repent. He needs to get right with God. He needs to agree to obey and go to Nineveh. But rather than do that, he says, ah, you probably just need to kill me. Which, of course, you know, they're decent people. They don't want to do that. But the storm doesn't relent, so they throw Jonah overboard. And the sailors actually become worshipers of the Hebrew god Yahweh in this process because after they throw him overboard and the storm stops, they see his great power and majesty. And so Jonah inadvertently evangelizes this whole ship of pagan sailors. But he's done for. He's in the sea, the symbol in the Hebrew ideology of chaos and death. He's done for. And yet, as he's thinking, as he is all but dead, he turns to God in his desperate need. And God shows him grace. Not pleasant grace, not happy, fun grace, but grace nonetheless in the uh, form of a great fish who comes and swallows him. And last week we looked at his psalm, acknowledging God's grace and, and recognizing the mercy that God showed to him. And yet we also noticed that it was a little bit lacking in the I'm sorry, part of repentance, right? And yet God was uh, gracious to him in spite of that lack of humility and in spite of that lack of sorrow over his own rebellion and sin. 
So that's where we pick up the story this morning. If you haven't already done that, please turn to that passage Emily read for us, uh, beginning at the first verse of Jonah chapter 3. If you've got a Bible or on your phone or wherever, uh, love to have you follow along. I'm going to use the New Living Translation this morning, but feel free to follow along in your uh, own preferred translation. We're going to begin by looking at uh, verses 1 through the first half of verse 3 this morning. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. So Jonah gets a second chance to obey. Now, as far as we know, we, we, don't, we have not been told yet what Jonah's objection to the original assignment is. But as far as we know, nothing has changed. A and as far as we know, uh, nothing internally in Jonah has changed all that much. But nevertheless, he agrees to go to Nineveh. Now, it's important for us to know a little bit about the city of Nineveh, and namely that it was the largest, most powerful city in the world at that time, and it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And m most of us may have heard of the Assyrian Empire. We have some vague sense that it was a, a powerful empire at some point in the past. But what's relevant for us to know is that the Assyrian Empire was quite possibly the most ruthless, wicked empire in all of human history. Uh, you can think of all of the atrocities that you've heard about historically that one group of people conquering another group of people has committed in all of human history, and the Assyrians are right up there with the worst of them. Their government policy was genocide. When they conquered a place, they would kill a large portion of the population, and then the people that they didn't kill, they purposely divided up, dividing families, dividing communities, and sent them to the far corners of the Assyrian Empire so that their sense of ethnic, cultural identity would be eradicated. Not only that, but their tactics in war and the way they tr treated prisoners were horrific. They were a wicked, wicked people. And Jonah is being sent to Nineveh at the height of their power. On only 150 years from then, the, the city of Nineveh and the empire of the Assyrians is going to fall. But in the meantime, they are going to be used by God to punish the nation of Israel, those ten northern tribes where Jonah had, minister, had uh, been ministering, to wipe them out with that policy of genocide. That's where we get the phrase, the ten lost tribes of Israel. It was the wicked Assyrians that wiped them out. This is who Jonah is being sent to, to their capital city at a time when they are a great enemy of his people, at a time where they're at the height of their power and the height of their wickedness. And Jonah, this time, goes. And so I think the author is inviting us to maybe be a little bit suspicious of Jonah's obedience here, right? Because what we have here is obedience without repentance. Yes, we saw him turn to God in his desperate need, but we did not see him acknowledge that he had done anything wrong, that he needed to change his attitude toward God. We saw even in his prayer uh, of vowing to obey God, that same issue of spiritual pride coming up in, in contrasting himself with those who worship false, uh, false gods. When it was the worshipers of the false gods on the ship that had actually obeyed Yahweh, when Jonah himself had not. So there hasn't been any evidence of internal change in Jonah. We haven't seen any true repentance. And yet he says, okay, God, I'll go. One trip to the bottom of the ocean is enough for me. I'm going to go this time. But we have reason to be a little suspicious. And as we continue on in our text, we have a lot of reason to be suspicious. Look at the second half of verse 3 and verse 4. It says, a city, this is talking about Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowd, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Your uh, translation may vary um, from the way the New Living translates this as a th uh, it took three days to see it all. Literally in the Hebrew, the phrase there is, it was a three-day journey city. And various translations and 
Uh, Bible scholars have interpreted that to mean different things, how long it took to cross the city, how long it took to go around the city, how long it took to cross the area of land where that city was the central area. Um, what, what the New Living Translation is suggesting here, and I think that's probably the most likely explanation, is that it took about three days to really get to all the parts of the city, right? And it, m most ancient cities were relatively small. You could go to the center square. You could begin speaking, and you could kind of touch the entire city in one visit to one central square. Nineveh was not that kind of city. It was so big that it, should, it would have taken about three days to get to all the neighborhoods, all the, s the squares, ac according to um, the text here. Um, but notice that it says, on the day Jonah entered the city, and literally in the Hebrew, that's one day journey into the city, Jonah preaches. Now, it does not explicitly say that Jonah stopped preaching then. It's possible that what we read about that happens next, this remarkable repentance happens so fast that Jonah doesn't get a chance to keep going. It could be that Jonah was planning to put in all three days that it would have taken to do the job. But where we're at with Jonah at this point, maybe we don't necessarily want to give him the benefit of the doubt, right? It seems to me that the author is contrasting uh, Jonah's actual effort with the effort that should have been required for this job. He says it's a three-day job. It takes three days. Jonah did it in one day. And maybe that isn't because he worked three times harder than you would have expected, right? And then we're given this message that Jonah declares. I in the Hebrew language, it's just five words. It's translated here as 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Not much of a sermon. Now, again, to be fair to Jonah, very often in Scripture, we get a short statement summarizing a longer message, right? We have that many of the teachings of Jesus, many of the teachings of the apostles, many of the Old Testament prophets. You'll get a summary statement when actu in actuality probably more words were said. So it's entirely possible that Jonah spoke more than these five words, although we're not told that he necessarily did. If he's really trying to mail it in, maybe he just said the five words, but maybe he said more than that. And yet, if that's the case, the five words included here, the message included here, would have been an accurate summary of the totality of what he had to say. So what is the totality of what Jonah has to say? He says, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Now, if we go back to Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, and we see the message that God originally told no Jonah to give to Nineveh. There's no mention of 40 days. In fact, there's no mention of God necessarily destroying the city. He says, go and preach against the city because it has been rebellious. It's been sinful. It's been wicked. Preach a message of judgment, but it doesn't promise destruction. So has God given Jonah more information now, or is Jonah projecting a little bit? Is Jonah giving his own interpretation of what God's message of judgment is. Not only is there some stuff included here that may not have been part of Jonah's initial message, but there seems to be some kind of important things left out of this sermon, right? Like God, for example. For example, There's no mention of God here. He doesn't even declare himself to be a representative of Yahweh. And one way we know that that's not just left out in the summary is that Yahweh is not mentioned by the king of Nineveh when he repents. He says, maybe God, and he uses the generic term for God, will relent. He doesn't even recognize that their repentance is a response to the God of the Hebrews. That's bad work by a prophet representing the God of the Hebrews if you forget to mention you're representing the God of the Hebrews. You know what else is missing here? A call to repent. He doesn't say unless you repent or you better repent. He just says you're done for. In fact, not only is there not a call to repent, there is no reason given for why Nineveh would be destroyed. Now, the people of Nineveh were able to figure that out, right? Like they knew, they knew that they were not, you know, on the nice list. And yet, if we look at the pattern of God's Old Testament prophets, although there are times in the Old Testament where the prophets speak judgment, and the, the message is, it's too late to repent. This judgment is coming regardless of what you do. There is never an example where God does not give his reasons 
he always lays out the sins that have been committed, the violations that have occurred that have brought on this destruction. And yet there is no mention of that at all in Jonah's sermon. This is a bad job, guys. He is not doing a good job as a prophet. It seems that he's either mailing it in or intentionally sabotaging the mission that he's been given by God. This is half-hearted obedience at best. And yet, look what happens. Verses 5 through 9. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robe. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even now, yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying them. The people believed and the people repented. There's a few more details here that, that show that this is not the result of Jonah's good work. Right. First of all, they, they believed not Jonah's message. They believed God's message. God's message got through despite Jonah's failure to deliver it well, because God's message was one of repentance from sin. And even though Jonah doesn't articulate that, he, he gives the barest uh, approximation of that, that he can still claim that he was obeying God through that. The message of repentance gets through. We also note here that the king of Nineveh doesn't hear this message from Jonah. You'd think he would start with the king, right? He doesn't hear this message from Jonah. He hears it through word of mouth. And yet he responds by declaring that the entire city must repent. And this is really remarkable over-the-top repentance here, guys. Right? Even the animals have to wear sackcloth or burlap. Right? Even the animals don't get to eat or drink as part of the repentance. And there's all kinds of theories about why this is and what did that reflect. Uh, I think the, the point here is that it's supposed to be kind of a ridiculous, over-the-top example of repentance. A another thing that shows that although it would be common w for people that are expressing grief and sorrow to fast, to refrain from eating, and to sit in heaps of ashes, and to wear sackcloth or burlap, those are all cultural expressions of sorrow and regret if disaster struck if there were a, a close relative died these would be ways that you would express that this is over the top because not only the animals included but they're not to drink anything that's really dangerous in the middle east guys it wasn't something that happened very often so the the painting uh the picture being painted for us by the author here is one of extreme exaggerated repentance Extreme exaggerated sorrow over sin. And it contrasts sharply with the absolute lack of sorrow over sin that we saw from Jonah, right? Jonah's happy to turn to God. He's happy to say that God is the true God, that God rescued him, uh, that God is the one who has the power to save. But we don't see a hint of actual sorrow from Jonah over what he did. Contrast that to the most wicked city in the world expressing this extreme example of of repentance it highlights the absence of that sorrow from jonah there's also something interesting going on here that we miss in the english language and that is that when jonah goes around and proclaims that in 40 days nineveh will be destroyed the word he uses for destroyed is a hebrew word hefek and hefek literally means turned over now that was a a word that commonly described absolute destruction right it's it's a figure of speech that means something is completely destroyed it's turned over it's turned upside down but it can also refer to a radical transformation or change and so unwittingly this message of repentance gets out even though jonah doesn't seem to be attempting to communicate it 
This was clearly a miracle of God. This was not something Jonah was trying to accomplish. And we get that made quite clear for us by the end of our passage. And yet God does it anyway. It's surprising. It's miraculous. But that's just the way God works. And that's really one of our key concepts from our passage. God can use half-hearted service to accomplish great things for him. God can use half-hearted service to accomplish great things for him. Even if we're not all in, that's not going to mess up what God wants to do. He doesn't need us to really give it our all for him to do what he wants to do. Because he doesn't need us in the first place. This is really something that is important for us to keep in mind. God doesn't actually need anyone to do anything for him to accomplish his purposes in the world. He's perfectly capable of accomplishing whatever he wants to without us. Now he chooses to involve us. He chooses to use us. But he doesn't need anyone. He uses imperfect, flawed people all the time. And praise God for that, because all of us would be out of a job otherwise. But when we start to see God using someone in a powerful way, and we begin to believe that God needs that person to accomplish those things, that is a dangerous thought process to get into. From time to time, a story breaks of some scandal uh, around a pastor of a mega church or a head of some ministry or something like that. And, and very, very often when that initial story breaks and there's some further questioning and investigation, you find that there was a pattern of moral compromise, a, a pattern of, of treating people abusively and disrespectfully, a, a pattern of not really living out one's own teaching. And very, very often, the justification for that person continuing in ministry, for, for the people around them covering it up and looking the other way and, and minimizing the things that they were doing that didn't honor God was, but look at everything they're doing for God. Yeah, okay, maybe you shouldn't talk to people that way. Yeah, okay, maybe they failed in this area morally. But, but look at all the good that they are accomplishing for God's kingdom. Wouldn't it be harmful to God's kingdom if we held them to the standard of God's word and, and removed them from ministry? You see the problem with that thinking? God doesn't need that person to do what God wants to do. And the end result is, actually, the witness of the church is damaged tremendously. God doesn't need anyone he can use anyone but he doesn't need anyone god did not need jonah to go to nineveh in order for nineveh to repent that was all god right i mean jonah did as poor a job as you could pretty much do and god still got the job done god didn't need jonah to go to nineveh for nineveh to repent but he needed jonah to go to nineveh for jonah to repent it was for jonah's benefit that he was sent on that assignment. And the need Jonah has is made very clear in our last two verses this morning. It says, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. Now, there's a phrase in verse 10 there that is a little problematic for some of us theologically, and that is that God changed his mind. And this isn't the only place we see that in Scripture. There's a number of places in Scripture that talk about God changing his mind. We're not going to spend too much time this morning getting into all the theology of the fact that God is omniscient. He knows everything all the time. He, he is uh, never surprised by anything. He's never caught off guard. That's very clear in Scripture. So in what sense can God change his mind? Well, what we have to understand is that the writers of Scripture 
describe God in the Bible in ways that you and I can relate to as human beings, right? There's verses in the Bible that talk about the eyes of God, the arm of God, the mouth of God. Now, we know that, that God is spirit, right? He doesn't, he's not limited to a physical body. He doesn't have an arm or eyes or a mouth in the same way we do. But those are ways for us to understand God from a human perspective. And so when it talks about God changing his mind, it's talking about God doing something that's like what we do when we change our mind. Here's the thing about God. He chooses to interact with and relate to human beings. And because that relationship is real and not just pretend, not just a fiction, he actually responds to us. When we do things, it affects us. God. Now, it doesn't affect God in the same way that it will affect another human being because God is omniscient. He exists outside of time and space. But his response to human activity is very, very similar to the response of a human being who changes their mind based on what another human being does. And so that's what's being described here. God is responding to the city of Nineveh. In that sense, he is changing his mind. But the real emphasis here for us and for Jonah is that God shows grace to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't like that. That makes Jonah angry. And it's very easy for us to kind of laugh at that and make fun of that because he just showed grace to Jonah, right? But what we have to understand at, is that at our core, all of us naturally are offended by grace when we see it as undeserved until we recognize that we need that same undeserved grace. Grace is not fair. God choosing to forgive, God choosing to bless people who don't deserve to be forgiven or blessed is not fair. And there's something instinctive in us that doesn't like that unfairness, right? Now, we also know from elsewhere in Scripture that God has the justice side of things handled, and, and we can't always make sense of that in our mind. But the fact that people that don't deserve good things get good things fundamentally feels wrong to us. But here's the thing. You and I don't deserve good things from God. And we get those good things. But we're really, really good at thinking that, yeah, okay, maybe we don't technically deserve those good things, but we're more deserving of those good things than a lot of other people. And that's where Jonah was, right? He hadn't dealt with his spiritual pride. He hadn't really understood how undeserving of God's grace he was. So naturally, when God shows grace to the most wicked city in the world, to the enemies of God's people, to the purveyors of genocide, it's going to be offensive to Jonah. Here's the problem. Jonah obeyed God. He went and served God, but he wasn't really on board with God's agenda, was he? In fact, it seems that he was either mailing it in, not giving his best effort, or actively trying to sabotage what God hopes to accomplish when he points out sin to sinful people. God's desire in pointing out sin to sinful people is always for repentance and restoration. Jonah wasn't on board with that. And see, that is the problem with half-hearted service to God. It's not that it's going to mess up God. It's that it's going to mess up us. And that's our second key concept this morning. Half-hearted service can harden our hearts toward God's way of working. If I am not really on board with what God is doing, if I am not really on board with God's goals and aims, and I'm just serving him out of a sense of duty. I'm just serving him because I'm afraid what will happen if I don't. I'm just serving him because it looks good to the people around me and I want to be known as one of God's people. And I persist in that, that disconnect that I have with God, th th that can be hardened, that can become entrenched. And that's clearly what happens with Jonah here. His sinful attitude that caused him to rebel against God to begin with, was never dealt with. And so even though he's serving God now, 
it doesn't fix the problem. This is a story about Jonah. It's not a story about Nineveh. It's not a story about a great fish. It's a story about Jonah. And it's a story that we're going to finish up next week because he's still got a lot of work to do with God. Because Jonah is angry simply because his agenda is not aligned with God's agenda. And, and his idea of grace is not aligned with God's idea of grace. And really, to put it bluntly, his idea of grace is not aligned with reality. Because according to Jonah's ideas about grace, Jonah should be dead at the bottom of the ocean. But he hasn't fully grappled with that yet. So we're going to look at that next week. But when we consider this example in chapter 3 of Jonah's half-hearted service to God, this is the takeaway we get. This is the big idea for our message. That half-hearted service isn't a threat to God's sovereign plans, but it is a threat to our unity with him. God wants you to serve him. He wants you to work with him and for him in this world. He wants him, you to be part of his mission, part of his kingdom. You know why? It's not because he's tired and he could really use some help. It's not because he's got too much on his plate. Can he just shove some of it off onto yours? He's not understaffed. That's not the reason. The reason is because he wants to be closer to you. He wants to be united with you. And the best way to be united with someone is to do work with them. God wants your service not because he needs anything from you, but because you absolutely need something from him. And so his grand plans for the universe are not in jeopardy when we mail it in. He's not going to get stressed. He's not going to get worried. He's not going to panic. Because you and I don't give it our best. But when we show up to God in a half-hearted and reluctant way, when we show up to be part of what God is doing, and our heart isn't really in it, we don't experience the unifying impact of working with God. In fact, it can actually begin to drive a wedge against us because we start to think that we're doing God a favor. We start to think that God kind of owes us one because I didn't really want to be here in the first place, and I'm doing it for you, God. Why aren't you a little more grateful? That attitude can sneak up on us. I, I've, I've been there. I've had to repent of that attitude. I'm doing this for you, God. Yeah, but not because he needs it. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. It's for my benefit. And so the reason he doesn't want half-hearted, reluctant service is because half-hearted, reluctant service defeats the whole point of service, which is for me to be in line with God and experience the joy and blessing of being more united with Him. And half-hearted service is not a threat to God's sovereign plans, but it is absolutely a threat to our unity with Him. So what do we do about that? I think there's, there's two things we can take away from this. One is we need to recognize that, that repentance is not a one-time thing, right? There's a very real sense in which Jonah repented, right? When he was under the water, he turned toward God in his desperate need. And God honored that repentance by showing him grace. But he was not done with the work of repentance. And if we're honest, none of us in this room today are done with the work of repentance. Because repentance is all about turning away from my way of doing things and turning toward God's way of doing things. And for most of us, that happens in stages. And if we're, we're really blessed 
we might get to a point where we have 100% turned away from our way of doing things and 100% turned toward God's way of doing things. But you know what happens when we wake up the next morning? We start to get some more ideas about how we want to do things. And we've got to turn away from those. And the next morning and the next morning, that continually engaging in that ongoing process of repentance is necessary for us to be fully aligned with God, for us to really serve him wholeheartedly. We have to recognize that repentance is an ongoing thing. Not so that I can make sure I don't lose my salvation or I'm afraid what's going to happen to me if I die, if I don't repent the right way. But if I'm going to work with God, if I'm going to be aligned with God wholeheartedly, I need to continually turn away from my way of doing things and turn toward God's way of doing things. You know one other way I know that repentance is a continual process? The city of Nineveh got wiped out. Archaeologists couldn't even find it until like 75 years ago or something like that. Because this repentance didn't last. They turned from God, they turned toward God in that moment of radical repentance, but it didn't last because they didn't continually turn their heart toward him. The second thing we need to do is we need to understand that serving God is for our benefit, not for his. As soon as we think God owes us one, we're in trouble. God doesn't need you for anything. You do not have an indispensable gift. But God absolutely wants to use you in a unique and special way that only you can fulfill. Now, if you withhold that from God, not a problem. He's the sovereign God of the universe. But he has given you an opportunity to minister in your particular network of relationships, with your particular experiences, with your particular gifts, to do something that nobody else could do to advance his purposes. And that should be exciting to us. That should be something that gets us out of bed in the morning. That should be something that gets us running to want to be aligned with God and his mission. But always understanding that it is our opportunity to be blessed to be part of God's work in a unique way, and never that God's so lucky to have me, he'd really be up a creek otherwise. You see the difference? It's not about diminishing our value or what God wants to accomplish through us. God did something amazing through Jonah. But the reason he did it through Jonah wasn't because Jonah was the only one that could do it. It was because Jonah needed that experience. And whatever it is God has laid on your heart this morning that he wants you to do to serve him, whatever opportunity the Holy Spirit is bringing to mind right now, the reason you should say yes is not because God's going to be in trouble if you don't. The reason you should say yes is because you have an opportunity to be part of God's eternal work, to be united with him and his mission in a unique and powerful way. And who wouldn't want to say yes? God wants our service, but he wants our wholehearted service. Not because half-hearted service is a threat to him and his sovereign plans, but because half-hearted service gets in the way of the blessing of unity that comes when we serve God wholeheartedly. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the example of Jonah. We thank you for the example of grace you showed to Jonah and the hope that gives us with all our stumbles and failures and times that we have rejected you or run from you or served you half-heartedly. We thank you for the example of Jonah because of the warning it is to us that even though you might do great things through us, we will miss out on the true blessing of serving you if we don't serve you with our whole heart. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to turn from our ways this morning and turn toward yours, that we would embrace your ways of doing things, that we'd embrace your values and your priorities, that we would join with you in pursuing your mission for the world, not because you need us, not so that you'll owe us, 
but so that we can experience the joy and blessing of being united with you in your work. We pray these things in Jesus' name.